In the New York Times this morning, front page, there's a story which says that um, May has failed for the third time mm -hmm. to um, get her program on the Brexit mm -hmm. through the Parliament. But there's another statement right after that piece of news. Does anybody read the Times? Did anybody read that? I looked at the headlines. I forget. You it's forget. something about her being a bad Well, no, the other statement is that there was no <coughs> alternative. <laughs> okay. And if you want to describe um, uh, the point, or at least one of the major points of the manifesto, what would you say? Um, one thing that jumped out at me at this reading, um, also based on, I wasn't here last, night, last week, but I listened to the recording. One thing that jumped out at me in terms of the question, what does it mean to be on the left, was that um, the issue of private property is non-negotiable. Either you challenge private property or you are not in the game. That's a very good pre preliminary way of stating it. And the other thing no. that jumped out at me yeah. this time, based on everything that's happened to the left in the past 10 years, is that he starts with a specter is haunting. I mean, that means that the left has to be a threat, an actual threat. It has to inspire fear. And I don't know when the last time that was. 1970. But it's been a while. <laughs> Did you have something? No, I just said 1917 was the last time that there was a big fear. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. just kidding. I mean, yeah, but then maybe I mean, that's, 49, that's 59 and different. Uh, I mean, and it, it did make me kind of think about my union, is that, you know, without, without the tool, without the instrument of the strike, you can't inspire fear, and so you, you can't get anywhere. You don't throw yourself on their mercy. Your union, which one is that? The Your wall. union. Huh? Your union. My union? PSC. <coughs> My union. Well, I, I have benefits. Why do I need an alternative for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to say any, any more about what the point is or what one of the major points are? You can say anything you want. <coughs> I mean, the, uh, I don't want to dominate, but <laughs> at the end he goes through the different um, extant so-called alternatives, the parties, et cetera, the different tendencies. And he rejects them all basically, as I saw it, on the basis they do not represent an overturning. They do not represent a fundamental transformation. But what do you need to have a fundamental transformation? I th I, what did I, they say? I mean, I think that that I mean it, it's there's no struggle without class struggle, and that you have to you have to fundamentally change the social relations of capitalism. Yes, and what does that mean? It means the proletariat has to take state power. Yeah take state power? Okay. I don't know about the it was called the dictatorship Party. of the proletariat. <laughs> <laughs> well, <there's that. laughs> Maybe even transitionally, but yeah. Right. Well, what would they do transitionally? Did you pick that up? It's <laughs> almost a... Uh, <laughs> I don't have that kernel of truth, so. But, I mean, I... You know, this rereading this kind of helped clarify to me where I feel a disconnect, I mean, maybe not from the time they were <coughs> writing, but their whole both kind of analysis of 
the present society and projection of a path toward revolutionary transformation hinges on the proletariat as the agent of that. And they see the proletariat as essentially becoming the majority of society because all other classes except yeah. the bourgeoisie are going to be proletarianized. And I think that the way modern societies have evolved is has shown that that is not that's an oversimplified vision of where things were going and that the class structures are much more complex than just the proletarian and the bourgeoisie and that a you lot remember of this is written in 18 no no I, I mean granted that <coughs> but that's if we're talking about today it's not clear to me that the industrial proletariat as they were describing sure. it is in a position to be the main the main agent of fundamental transformation and at least in western capitalism at least so yes yeah. yeah but i think that if you take off the first part of that the industrial proletariat right. what i noticed <coughs> in this was how what he's how much what he said has come true he said that all professional sectors of the population. These are two d names for one person? You said he. Marx. Ma Marx and Engels. He, Say that, what? That's one person? Yeah. He. <laughs> Mangles. <laughs> they. 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 You can use the word they. Okay. okay. That they say that all previously that all the sectors that didn't imagine themselves as proletarians will become proletarianized by having their power over their labor taken away from them. I think that what we what we're seeing like professors, they're proletarianized. Doctors, they're proletarianized. All these pr so-called professional sectors that we thought were very sort of you know had had power over their own labor actually don't. So I sort of saw it I that way. Good. Can I go to the uh, text because I think it maybe clarifies what you're saying, maybe to show maybe there's a fundamental um, value to rereading this in terms of fundamentals. And I mean, I hear what you're saying about the n lack of resonation that it may be situated in 47, 48 instead of 2019. But if you turn to, I, I have a different edition. I'm on the about the sixth paragraph that begins, the bourgeoisie historically have played a most revolutionary part. Uh, it's about nine paragraphs into the first uh, section, you know, on the, where Marx and uh, Engels, bourgeois and proletarians, right? And it begins, the bourgeoisie historically has played the most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, whenever it has gotten the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations, and has piteous, piteously torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his quote unquote natural superiors and is left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self interest, than callous cash payment. It is drowned in the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, chivalrous enthusiasm, Philistine sentimentalism, in the icy water of chivalrous enthusiasm, I mean of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefeasible charter freedom, has set up that single, unconsciously, unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions, it has sustained naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. Then he goes on, the bourgeoisie, and this is, I think is interesting for our time, has stripped of its halo every <coughs> occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has con converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its page weight laborers. Yeah, so I'm this not so most sure that this value is so, you know, yeah, dated. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, it may yes not and be no. industrial, I mean, but yeah, it's proletarian. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are generations after them who lived professional lives that were f for those that were fortunate to get there satisfactory in terms of you know not being completely alienating labor the way they're describing here they, they had this kind of foresight I thought that what you read was the most compelling mm -hmm. part of the whole thing really but that that the kind of proletarianization you're talking about 
I think it's a shock because it, it, it didn't seem that way even 20, 30 years ago, which is already about 150 years after they wrote this. So it's, it, it's, it, it, there's kind of a, an essential truth there, but I think things have played out in a much more complex way and left us in a much more confused <coughs> set of class self-identifications and class structures than they they thought the trajectory of things were going to lead to. But I think, I mean, in some ways it leads to um, the empirical question. Rather than sort of negate um, the framework that they lay out, it opens up the question of, so um, if capital creates its own grave diggers, if it has to organize labor in such a way uh, in order to make profit, um, that it empowers that labor force to um, <coughs> challenge the rule of capital over that entire structure, then the empirical question is how is capital organizing labor forces currently well, such that it absolutely has to and that it also empowers those forces. The necessary, you've just stated, Damon, the necessary but not the sufficient condition. Necessarily, <coughs> the uh, bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. And then and then it says then they say well, I don't know how to say this, this is very close to where you were, yeah. Michael. Yeah. The bourgeoisie has taken through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country to the great chagrin of reaction of reactionists. It has drawn from under the, fe the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. It, it becomes its own grave digger because it creates the class in human history which is capable of displacing a ruling class, not just capital. Capital is the present um, form. Um, because of its, of its revolutionization of the instruments of production and new relations, which is really key, um, it will create its own grave digger. But that's the necessary condition. What they say as sufficient, as I read it down the road, is that even the feudal aristocracy can make a critique of capitalism. I would suggest to you that even the liberal elite can do a searching critique of capitalism. If not a fundamental critique, at least one that will make uh, many people pleased to hear a Noam Chomsky, a Jeremy Scahill, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. condemn uh, big corporations and, and so forth. Um, uh, I missed you, Ben. I said, I Ben didn't show up. I have a Saturday class, so. You were promised. Yeah, anyway. good to see everyone. Sorry <laughs> I'm late. Anyway, why I, why, we, why, why I called attention to start with to the front page of the Times today is that while the Labour Party can emulate Archie Bunker, how can I say no? You say no, <laughs> and that's and that's where uh, Corbyn is, and the Labour Party has been for a very long period. But what it does not have, and what a lot, uh, uh, it's not a, it's not comparable precisely to the to the to the um, aristocracy, but what the Labour Party, the main opposition, does not have, is a conception of the steps that will be required to be able to overturn uh, the system of production of, uh, of social relations more broadly. Uh, it's not a program with numbers. It's a, it's a process. They, can, they are a party of no. And the um, various labor and communist and socialist parties have been parties of no. 
saying we will replace capitalist social relations with socialism or communism, which never gets specified. Specified not in definitional terms, but in processual terms, because they do say in the in in this document that parliamentary activity can be a step along the way. Did you catch that? Yeah. yeah. Parliamentary activity in is coalition, not a even with other with <coughs> what? In coalition, even with in coalition, right? Even with. Jeremy Cahill. <laughs> uh, or, um, that was a good slip, Stanley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or Jezza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah, slip? Yeah. It wasn't a yeah, slip yeah, at no, all. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but what do you see as the process by which this system would be overturned? And what, well, would, the, and what does it mean to forge a future? If you forge a future in purely parliamentary terms, and you do not scare, uh, uh, scare the living Jesus out of large sections of the population as well as the uh, the rulers, you haven't gone very far. C can I go back to this question of value just for the text again? You I'm not going to argue against okay, you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Further down, on the uh, from where I read before, um, uh, the bourgeoisie by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production. This is about four uh, four paragraphs um, uh, forward in the section section one. Uh, by the immense facilitated means of communication, draws all even the most barbarian nations into civilization. Right. But to go further down, it compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst, that is, to become bourgeois themselves. And in a word, it creates a world after its own image. So again, to go back to this thing about it, whether this is so dated, I mean, if you're only yeah. dealing with wage demands and, you know, in, in terms of struggles, you're not really creating a new world or a Stanley would just say forging something different, right? You're basically, most of these professions that he's said that have had their, the halo stripped from its occupation are all modeled on the bourgeois idea, but on the bourgeois image of what they think they should be. So in a way, the, the, the problem here, to me at least, and I think they've put their finger on it, is how do, you do a, how do you really create a different world and a different human being? You know, and this, uh, this is, uh, you know, I think something that is still very relevant from this uh, this text, you know, yeah. even though the obviously the historical economic conditions have changed radically, you know, during you know the last 150 years, or 170 years since this was written. Yeah. No, I thought all yeah. this whole section that's been quoted yeah. was the most amazing to me, and mm -hmm. in a way, I said I, I couldn't really understand how they saw that at that time because that this process was almost in its infancy when they were writing it. That, that, that part was really in incredible to me. But elsewhere they me say the 1848 revolutions in <coughs> France, in Germany, and the mass movement of strike movement in, in Britain, uh, particularly those three um, developments uh, bring for the first time in human history a more developed proletariat into the uh, threshold of history. The real, the real point of, of, uh, of their uh, narrative to me is that what does it take to make history not a wage increase? Mm. Uh, not that the wage increase is unnecessary, but what does it take to make history? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting also, like, the, the, what you were talking about with the, the Labour Party in you know, Great Britain, the, you know, they really are divided up into two sections. There's, 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 there, there are the Jer Jeremy Scahill uh, <laughs> section, <laughs> who are actually the newer, newer membership who've, who've, who've flooded in. Uh, but then, 
you had the people who in Manchester who voted for Brexit, and they want to throw the whole thing out. Right. So you yeah, know the it's Glenn a, Greenwald faction. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May I raise an, another issue that is mentioned in this passage? Standing began with, I believe, the bourgeoisie, whenever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. Mm -hmm. Throughout this, they use the term patriarchal in a very positive way. It's associated with idyllic relations that are superior to what occurs in capital. And I wonder if anyone has any thoughts about that. Patriarchal rule by fathers. Yes. They have it in another place that in the manifesto, don't they say that um, the bourgeoisie reduces the family to money, re purely money relations? Yeah. Cash yeah. nexus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, is, is it a different true? patriarchal? I mean, because it, it, no? I don't see the bourgeoisie like uh, uh, putting an end to patriarchal. I think what they're meaning so, by, I mean, yeah. by uh, patriarchal you know, there is. Reducing the it's, it's oh, idyllic relations. <laughs> are all way. idyllic relations gone? But I was going to say, I think what in the, in the passage that you were quoting, patriarchal, I think, more refers to like the relationship between the Lord and the serf, sort of that, yes, of that kind of. Yeah, but, but throughout this, there are, I think, about five instances of use of patriarchy. Yeah. 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 And in each one, in fact, in several of them, it's exactly connected with idyllic. And if we're exploring how to create a new society, a better society, the process of reproduction here is hidden. Well, with, uh, just to build on that, what was the slavery question in the pre-Civil <coughs> War period? What did it consist in? What did the, what did the slave, um, um, pro-slave people argue? Well, they were taking care of the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the slaves. They were the, uh, they were the, uh, the people who made sure the slaves were fed and clothed and, you know, they were, they had the responsibility to take up the white man's burden. Right. That's exactly right. They talked about slavery as if it was a patriarchy, however, a patriarchy that took care of its, um, <coughs> of its slaves. <coughs> yeah, and that without the slaves, the blacks would be um, chaotic, <laughs> could not rule themselves. Um, this, uh, this goes on and on and on and on. Um, not only with respect to slavery, but with, with respect to class. The, 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 job of, the job of education, as I see it, is to make sure that no demands are made of the system that would be part of a, a, a process of upheaval of the system itself. Anything that can be accommodated within the system is acceptable and anything <coughs> that, is, uh, that would not be accommodating within the system is unacceptable. And that's why it's possible for even the most militant of liberals to attack capital as uh, corporations, the word that is used is corporations, not capital, um, because 
they can foresee no fundamental change of the system after the collapse of the Soviet Union and what has happened in China, which is state, which can be described with the Soviet Union as forms of state capitalism. Although there are private ownership in China that didn't exist in the Soviet Union, you have state capitalism and, and you can't turn this over to the people much less the proletariat uh, under any circumstances because what it will lead is uh, worse conditions. <clears throat> Anybody who's had any experience with the labor movement will find this to be common. The um, company union people, whether they think of themselves as company union people or not, will say to the membership be careful when you choose to strike, you're going to lose a lot of money, inevitably. It's not, there's going to be no restitution of your losses during the strike. We have a union at the, at the city university in which the treasurer of the union stood before a meeting of members at the graduate center, which I attended some years ago, uh, not too long ago, actually, um, where she said exactly what I just repeated. We don't want strikes because they're going to cost a lot of money. We have a president of the union uh, at, the, at the City University who repeats that truism every time she makes a speech. Strikes are good for the for the for the um, poorest of the poor, but we are not that. We are professionals. We have to. We have negotiating. We have militant demonstrations. We can protest, and change m could happen as a result of protest. <clears throat> I read the Communist m Manifesto to say, protest is not going to do the trick. At best, what protests will do is to perfect the system, if that's possible. We are in a period, historically, when it's, a quest when it's questionable whether protest, no matter how much and how, how mass it is, can actually even improve the system, much less uh, transform it. But that's as far as anybody's gotten. On a, you have mass protests all over the goddamn place, but you don't have um, <coughs> transformation built into that. Yes, you have something to say? So, sometimes protest is dress rehearsal for new forms of surveillance. Yes. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I ha I, what, one thing that struck me Yes. In terms of like the Luxembourgian question, reform versus reform or revolution, was the last page where they say. First section? Yeah, the, no, the last page. Of the whole thing. Of the workers. Of the second to last page of the whole thing. Okay. Where he says, in Germany, they, meaning the proletariat, fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, um, blah, blah, blah. And, but then he goes down to say, yeah, they can fight with the bourgeoisie, but the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing and political order of things. And in all these movements that they can participate in, they bring to the front as the leading question in each, the property question, no matter what its degree of development at the time and they disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that <coughs> their aim ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of the existing order. All you have to do to, uh, to uh, cry is look at the history of the French, the British, the American, the Italian communist parties. Well, the French uh, Communist Party uh, and the Italian Communist Party 
uh, managed to get about a fifth of the vote and sometimes a quarter of the vote. Mm -hmm. They they hid their their point revolution. And that was one of the great, I use the word great uh, advisedly, not that I'm putting it down, I'm just saying it was extremely powerful influence of Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci gave the Italian Communist Party permission, because if he was a general secretary and he was a martyr, he died in prison, and he gave them permission to um, make something that looked like a permanent uh, um, <coughs> alliance with the Catholic Church, progressive forces, and other, um, um, and the left socialists, etc. It was a very interesting uh, thing that I that I, I figured out. I'm not saying that uh, anybody couldn't figure it out, but. The more I read of Gramsci, which is six volumes of the um, of his co collected papers, I've read three volumes of him, and I've read the uh, wonderful um, um, selections from the uh, from the papers by Clinton Hoare. And I'm saying this guy is uh, is uh, moving away from the Communist Manifesto which no, nobody would acknowledge. I mean, Toyati, who was the uh, sec general secretary of the Italian Communist Party, made a famous alliance with the Vatican. Right, which was the historic compromise of 1976. That's right, compromise of historical, right. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and actually, uh, Marx and Engels would not oppose that on principle. But what they would oppose is if that became the mode of existence of the, of the Communist Party. The mode of existence which is to continually make coalitions and never act on its own. And the fight within the Communist Party of Italy was between Gram the Gramsci faction and the faction that was called the extreme extremist or ultra revolutionary, led by somebody called Bordiga, B O R D I G O R A. Bordiga made the argument in the Communist Manifesto that you can't be a revolutionary party without calling for revolution, at least at least as your uh, as your ongoing uh, insistence in going into Parliament and discussing that openly. And the, uh, the Toyati faction, which was dominant in the party, disdained that, um, that position. Needless to say. I say needless to say because that's what the, what, what the manifesto suggests we, we discuss. Needless to say, the history of the post-Second World War Italian Communist Party, which was celebrated all over the world, focused on Gramsci and coalitions. There were some wonderful things that, that, uh, that, um, that uh, Gramsci said, no doubt. And if we were talking about Gramsci, we could discuss them. But um, Gr Gramsci has been regarded within Italy as a reform communist. Because uh, <coughs> he actually placed the issue of coalition and um, incrementalism ab above revolution. And he's sitting in jail writing this uh, scripture, and I use that word deliberately as well. Um, you know, liberation theology came out of uh, a marriage between <coughs> the Catholic Church and uh, the Italian Communist Party. Who do you have in, in mind? 
uh, of liberation. Well, Pope John the Twenty Third, you know. What? Pope John the Twenty Third, Vatican Two. Yeah, Pope John the Twenty Third, Vatican Two, borrowed a lot of his ideas from a guy named Segundo, who was a cardinal. <laughs> and Segundo's work is in English, but Bordiga's work. They were soliciting money to try to get it into a, a translation. And I contributed a hundred dollars. I never heard anything about it. I would support it because I think Godiva does represent another trend in the communist history, at least since since the 1930s. Which is interesting why uh, Negre and company don't even, you know, Engaged in our bomb sheet. No, that's the reason. They break completely. Yes. So they break and the autonomy of uh, the group mm. completely broke because of this matter. Yeah. Well, what's wrong they with saw. coalition? What? I mean, yeah. I mean, the labor union's always been in, I mean, John Lewis in Chicago, they were, I mean, coalition with Catholic Church and labor unions. I mean, Saul Linsky's first organizing was. With the communists. Now. Right, I'm just saying, it was like coalition, in terms of organizing, that's the name of the game, right? If you get enough people in your coalition, things move forward. I mean, and, and I would say, you know, I mean, reform versus revolution, obviously, we know where I, I fit in all of this, you know, but I, I still, what's wrong, with, what's wrong with some coalition work? I mean, Gramsci's a good organizer. One of the most um, revered unions in the history of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, CIO, was United Packing House Workers. <coughs> the Packing House Workers Union was organized primarily in Chicago and then spread out from there. And the lead organizer by everybody's um, admission was Herb Marsh, a member of the CP. Um, and throughout the history of the packing house work is there was no significant red baiting that succeeded in overturning any part of the, of the uh, union's uh, leadership. Um, Linsky, Saul Linsky, who was known as a great radical, I always wondered where the hell did that come from, except from the packing house yeah. experience where he organized with March and knew exactly who he was organizing with. But then, after the afterward, saw his coalitions primarily with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. John the Twenty Third was the high point of that coalition activity. Um, March is no longer alive, but it was a union which finally uh, merged with the amalgamated meat cutters and yeah. butcher workmen. And, that's, and today it's called the Food and Commercial Workers. It's the Packing House Division of the Food and Commercial Workers. Uh, that tradition is almost dead in that, in that union. Because, there's no, because that was of another generation that failed to um, bring along a new generation with it. I once asked the last major organizer of the CP Packing House Workers, he was a, uh, he was a uh, <laughs> vice president of the uh, Packing House Workers Union. His name was Jesse Preston, and his son was active in the uh, New Left, etc. And I once asked him, Did they have a new generation in the packing houses that carried out the traditions of the uh, organizing moment and the decades that followed it? The organizing moment was pretty early. It was about 1937 and 38. Um, it, it was alongside of the order workers. The order workers get all the publicity. Um, but this, the packing house workers don't get much publicity at all, except for uh, Alinsky, who really in many ways uh, waters down 
what a radical is. Um, uh, but the packing house workers from 1930s through the 1950s, early 60s, was a union in conflict with the mainstream of the labor movement, and particularly uh, the leader of the progressive wing of the uh, labor movement, Walter Rother. They were always in conflict until about 1955, <coughs> they joined this. They, 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 they joined. They were in the CIO and refused. 52, 53. I'm sorry, and refused <coughs> to uh, uh, leave it along with the United Electrical Workers, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers, the United Public Workers, and, United, and then the Fire and Other Workers Unions. They stayed in the CIO, and that meant that you had to renounce any connection with the Communist Party mm -hmm. or its front organizations, as they called it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that was a turning point. Jesse seemed to think that they gave up very little by joining the CIO. They gave up, at, among other things, the revolutionary moment. And that was considered sectarian at the time. <coughs> and Gramsci is now used to uh, criticize those who insist on that portion of the uh, manifesto that talks about the necessity of the constant reiteration and expansion of the revolutionary uh, uh, deed and thought. To, to bring it back to uh, Ben's question about what's wrong with coalition, maybe the text can elucidate a little bit of that too, right? I mean, uh, in the last <coughs> section, the position of the communists in relation to various opposition parties, um, so it begins with section two, and then the communist they begin. Hold on, section, section four. Yeah. Section four. Section four. Yeah. Okay. And it begins with section two, the, the paragraph. And then okay. the communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims, for the enforcement of the momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the communists ally themselves with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie. Reserving, however, the right to take up a critical position in regard to phrases and allusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. In Switzerland, they support the radicals, without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, par partly of the democrat socialists in the French sense, partly of radical bourgeois. In Poland, they support the party that insists on an agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation, that party which fomented the insurrection of Krakow in 1846. In Germany, they fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feudal um, squirearchy, um, um, squirearchy, right, and the petty bourgeoisie. Right? But they never cease for a single instant to instill in the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat in order that the German workers may straightaway use, as so many weapons against the bourgeois, the social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must necessarily introduce along with its supremacy and in order that after the fall of the reactionary classes in Germany, the fight against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin. So I think, I mean, here you can maybe substitute a lot of the movements today, you know, in, in a sense. You know, you can say here, you know, what coalition, right? Why a coalition, right? In, instead of just what's wrong with the coalition, you know, but, but what the specific terms would be of, of particular coalitions. I think they've already anticipated your your question in some ways in a very specific way. But there's no present day parallel to the communists in the days they were writing about. Now there's the coalitions are coalitions of non revolutionary parties or groups. That's that true. Yeah. But the, but there was even during the anti war <coughs> movement of the anti Vietnam War movement there was a uh, an, an, an antagonism within the movement that 
is expressed in, in what just Michael just read. Um, there was a uh, there was a discrete section of the anti-war movement that called itself the peace movement. What? And then there were others. The peace, peace, no, peace, peace, not peace, P E A C E. There were others who said we're not part of the peace movement. We are anti. We're part of the anti-war movement. And we're also anti-capitalist, and anti-capitalism is part of the uh, anti-war movement. And anti-imperialist also. Well, and anti-imperialist, anti yes. Well, you could, uh, uh, they have a way of talking about imperialism in 1848, which I think is quite interesting. They, they say that, I mean, you know, you can look at it this way. If the condition for the survival of capitalism is its constant expansion, then capitalism itself is hostile, is, is imperialistic. It, uh, but you see, what happens with Lenin is, uh, is that we have, uh, but Lenin borrows it from Bukharin. And Bukharin borrows it from the Germans, finance capital. Um, the old imperialism is, a, is an imperialism of, um, <coughs> of, of uh, taking territory um, and with an expansion. The new imperialism is an imperialism which must lead to war on the one hand, revolution on the other hand. Um, that was Bukharin's uh, framework in his book, Imperialism and World Economy, 1915. Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, which was not Bukharin's notion, it was Lenin's notion, came out in 1916, and it was intended, at least publicly, to be a um, popularization of um, Bukharin's imperialism in the world economy, which is in, which is in English. Um, both of them are in English. Uh, nobody reads Bukharin to speak of. They will read Lenin, of course, and they talk about the highest stage of capitalism. I don't, I don't know whether you've, you've ever given any thought to this. Uh, I do not hold to uh, the higher stage of capitalism notion. I think capitalism is about, in part, imperialism. I, I, you can't, capitalism ultimately will, as <coughs> Rosa Luxemburg has said, will reach the, li the limits of its national framework, and they do too. They say there's a national framework, which is not the framework, it's a <coughs> moment. The world stage would be, I think, excessive. But it's a moment in the development of capitalism, and finally, they all have to go beyond the international framework, and you'll have, therefore, the motion of, uh, of capitalism into, the movement of capitalism into uh, Latin America, the movement of capitalism into Africa, the movement of capitalism into Asia. Of course, you know that's one of the impetuses for uh, Negre and Hart to come up of with course. the term empire. Yeah. yeah. But to say that there is capitalism and then there's imperialism uh, submits to a stages theory of history. And the stages theory of history is, to a large extent, a Leninist formation. Um, he, he divides the world into one. Um, primitive communism or primitive communalism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, maybe, and communism. Uh, uh, and that is not intrinsic to, to Marx and, and, and Engels' thought. It's an important distinction. And we can debate the distinction if you want, I'd be happy to. But today, 
and even when I use the word today, I don't mean 2019. I mean today, meaning the um, post-Bolshevik moment, that is to say, from 1918 onward, Lenin is Marxism. It's now called Marxism-Leninism. And very few of us have any access to any other Marxism. The Italian Marxism, that is pre-Leninist, even the Gramscian Marxism, Marxism, which is side by side with Lenin, because um, Gramsci was uh, a, a leading figure in the uh, Italian Communist Party, even though he wasn't the leader. The leader was Bordiga. Uh, it was a very, very close relation with uh, the uh, the Communist International. I was always commenting on the Communist International. Um, so I think he actually, uh, I can be shown that he is not talking for himself. He's also following more or less the Leninist line, the line of, uh, of Lenin about stages, um, about about the nature of coalitions. Lenin actually may, may or may not have been responsible for it. In um, 1920, he wrote a pamphlet, which was uh, 21. I'm not sure, I forgot, I, I forget whether it was 20 or 21. Um, which was, which was called left-wing communism and infantile disorder. And that became a very important, how many people have read that? I might have. Yeah, I'm you sure read it. Everybody. <laughs> it was de rigueur. What? In my, in my infantile days. You're over the disorder. I think so. You're over the disorder. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not I sure remember I reading it, but I was high at the time. <laughs> yeah. That's and always, always part of my The leadership of whatever group you're in is always always passes that out, you know, right. so that you'll right. follow right. the right. leadership. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that is yeah. in, in, the, in, the, in the pamphlet, he refers to um, a fictional person called Jay Harper. H-A-R-P-E-R who was actually a leading figure of the Dutch Communist Party, whose name was Anton Panikola. Oh, P-A-N-N-E-K-O-E-K. -E -E stargazer. Uh, what? He was a stargazer. He was an astronomer. Right. He wrote a history of astronomy, right. which is right. in English. He wrote the Workers' Council. He wrote the <coughs> Workers' Council. You wrote the, there's a book called The Workers' Councils. Is it still in print? Yeah, we read it last semester. We, we read it here. Peter's class. You, with you? Not with me, but Peter. The class oh, with Peter. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we will, if it's in print, I would like to read The Workers' Councils. How many people were in Peter's class? It's in print. It's in print. No, no, that's I not what I said. Oh yeah, it said, but you said if it's in print, I would. No, like I to said read. no. I asked. I, Maybe I, six or seven. How many people? Maybe I six know, or seven. Six or seven. How many people in this room have read Panacoke's Workers' Council? Read in it, not the whole thing. Not the whole thing. <coughs> it's not a big book. It's a hundred some pages. Noam Chomsky writes the introduction. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the, trouble with, the, the trouble with Noam Chomsky is not his background. Right. right. It's not his. <laughs> it's not his linguistics. Uh, his linguistics are, um, as I said last time, are uh, uh, extraordinary, and uh, I don't subscribe to them. <laughs> I subscribe to a lot of his thinking, but not to his conclusions. But um, his politics initially were um, Stalinist, uh, which he, of course, repudiated and became a uh, independent uh, 
leftist during his uh, days at MIT, but there was no public expression in the United States of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, socialism that he uh, became attracted to, which was Panacoke's uh, socialism. Which is a, which the workers' councils is in fact what Marx and Engels are calling for. You may disagree with what they say, but that's what he says should be done. Here we have a man in uh, Britain who spent thirty now thirty five or thirty six years of his life sitting in Parliament as a left wing Labourite. Needless to say, who would call himself a Marxist, who is now the leader of the Labour Party, who did not see the feasibility or the or the um, advisability of uh, providing an alternative to um, um, May's version of Brexit. Yeah. It, he still is stuck in the protest phase of the left, which can be absorbed into the most um, mild version of social democracy in reformism. There's no indication except among the intellectual left in Italy and some trade unionists that the, uh, the Panacoke wing in Panacoke, the names are, it was called the International Council of uh, Correspondence. And the leading figures were Panacoke, and, uh, in, who was in, in, in the Netherlands, Paul Maddock, who was an American, Korsch, uh, uh, Korsch, Karl Korsch, who was German. And Holst, who was in the Netherlands, and Henrietta Watson in the Netherlands as well. They had a very small group that they published in the 30s, a systematic reputation, refutation of the position of the Communist Party and its coalition tactics. It's worth reading because it leads to a reading <coughs> of um, Workers' Councils by Panacoke. Um, and that's the position in Chomsky holds, but he never talked about it, except in that introduction, unless you know of some, some place where you've read uh, Chomsky on Workers' Councils. No? No. No, I don't, I don't read it. I don't find it. I mean, I've read it on anarchism. His book on anarchism. He has a really, book on anarchism. It's really, really good. Right. Because really Panikov yeah. wants to reorganize society on the basis of communes, of workers' councils. And he will have a detailed ex exposition of that position. So, uh, but not right now. Um, Wait, can I just. <coughs> The infantile disorder that Lenin was talking about? Yeah. I mean, wasn't that really written in the context of the Bolsheviks trying to centralize power and diminish the workers' councils that existed in the, in that, the post well, revolutionary they, they period? They crushed the workers' they councils the workers by councils. maintaining the name. Yes. Um, yes, but they had another position which is a position which was reiterated in uh, the 1960s uh, uh, during the uh, French uh, May, uh, but also during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the uh, POM, which was the party of independent leftists, some of whom were Trotskyists and some of whom were not, in Spain, who defended the Republic, um, argued, the Poom argued, that the best way to advance the Spanish Republic was to uh, seize the faculty when where, uh, the factories were feasible. The communists 
not only opposed the Poom, but went after them and made war against them. Well, the Poom and the anarchists. What? Spain had this huge anarchist movement. That's right, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, they weren't the anarchists. The anarchists had their own operation, the CNT. Anyway, but the Poom were friendly to the anarchists. Yeah. The communists were hostile to the anarchists. The Trotskyists were friendly. Um, and... Um, The, the position was originally iterated by the Dutch Communist Party in 1920 against the Soviet crushing of the uh, of the um, of the uh, uh, workers' councils and uh, for. Um, Workers' councils that had real power over the economy, mostly over the economy, and uh, that was very important for them. The next, is there anybody want to talk any more about the uh, about the manifesto? What about today? Well, there's something in the manifesto that I want that I think yeah. can connect yeah, to ahead. something yeah. today, which was so I was really intrigued, and I, I kind of know that this is kind of bubbling up a little bit today. That right at the beginning, there's a footnote about um, this. What I guess Engels call, or maybe it was even in his intro, sort of this. Then discovery oh, that there had been the all these. In the preface. Let me see if I can. It might have been in the preface. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. Well, um, but which preface? Basically about the what was then the kind of recent discovery of what he calls primitive communist societies in many parts of the world that. I guess was kind of a revelation then, mm -hmm. but that those, I think that certainly at the time that the manifesto was written through to today, there are many parts of the world, a decreasing number, but still, where there are sort of remnants of or echoes of or traces of this kind of communal life that um, was never totally wiped out either by you know feudalism or and, and in some ways could exist parallel to it but you know in the pre-feudal societies in indigenous communities in many parts of the world mm -hmm. still um, and and I you know there's I can't tell you who but there has been some recent writing about and Marx Sylvia, later. Sylvia Federici and Sylvia Federici would, mm -hmm. yeah. But that Marx, even you know, later in his life, sort of suddenly got interested in these kind of remnants of communal structures, like in the Russian Mir, for example. And that I think, to me, a lot of the most. Do you know in what form he actually got interested? Not specifically. He had he had a whole a whole um, a bunch of notes. He had notebooks on forms of communal ownership <coughs> that he got from uh, uh, ethno ethnographic, ethnographic notebooks, notebooks. Yeah. and he he collected a lot of them, yeah. and it's in print. Yeah. So, to me, some of the most interesting things not so much in the U.S., but maybe some in Europe, but are these, you know, for example, the Zapatistas in, in Mexico uh, and some of the movements, not necessarily the ones that came to, to power in places like Bolivia and Ecuador, where there are large indigenous populations, that you have these traditions that have never died of communal ownership, of communal 
democratic structures that have been linked to left-wing movements in places, but that are not necessarily, you know, I think the Zapatistas refuse to, to be in coalition with anybody, which is not true in Bolivia or Ecuador. Um, but sort of under, you know, there's this whole, again, much less so in the U.S. than in Latin America, but this, this kind of, the, the mantra is change the world without taking power, like really building these, you know, sort of yeah. communities of resistance outside of the existing frameworks, but trying to navigate how to survive within them. And I think that that's, it was just an interesting echo I found in the manifesto to that, yeah. those I developments mean, today. The Mexican Revolution uh, tried to institutionalize the, you know, the, the uh, so communal land holding. And, and did to some extent. And still, still to this day, there are large communal yeah. land holding. In capital, in the primitive accumulation chapter, there's a lot of material about displacing all those, some of those sure. communities all over Scotland, and I mean, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, what, what are you talking in, about? In capital, towards capital. the end, towards yeah. the end of the discussion about primitive accumulation, yeah. there's long discussion about displacement of uh, the Gales. I think I forget. Well, you'll find a more, uh, you will one will find a more elaborate version of that in the origin of the family. Private property in the okay. state by nice. Engels. Very it by by Engels. Engels. Oh, okay, yeah. check it out. Influenced by Lewis Henry Moore. Is this the first this time you heard of this book, The Origin of the Family? Yeah, I've heard of it, but I want to write it down because I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Like, uh, things go in this year and out the other unless I write it down. <laughs> <laughs> like so I'm just trying to, you know, there's a lot of shit. If I didn't keep Too my head attached. Too many coalitions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Time. <laughs> have no respect. <laughs> Rodney Dane right, right. 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 <laughs> Morgan. Yeah. Morgan let me just let me just recommend for those who are interested in the origin and in, in, in this idea of pri primitive communal societies and, and movements. Um, the origin of the family in the Marxist literature until the 20th century was probably the main text. But in the 20th century, an uh, anthropologist who taught at the Graduate Center of CUNY um, wrote a 75-page introduction to the origins of the family, which in the first place uh, laid out what the, what the fundamental thesis of the origin of the family is. In the second place, brought it up to date. Who was it? Eleanor Leacock. Eleanor Leacock. Um, Eleanor Leacock uh, was the daughter of Kenneth Burke. Kenneth Burke. Everybody knows the name Kenneth Burke, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ken Kenneth Burke. Kenneth Burke was a literary critic. He's a horror on the left, really. <laughs> major figure on the left. He was United a major States. figure yeah. on the left, close yeah. to the Communist Party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, wrote a bunch of books. I just want to recommend three. Uh, his, his book on literature, it's got literature in the title, you can't miss it, it's still in print, I think. Uh, and then two books on rhetoric, the rhetoric of religion and the rhetoric of, now I'm, I'm going crazy. The grammar Maybe. of motives. What? The grammar of motives. The grammar of, of motives, motives. Yeah. 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 The grammar yeah. of motives. And which the philosophy of... Uh, it's somewhere in my library, but it's yeah. all over the place right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the rhetoric of religion and the grammar of motives and... Uh, the, the, the book on literature are really fundamental books of his uh, position. And he was, uh, he was by profession a literary critic who wrote, what, 
What's the uh, book on literature? What was the book on literature? Philosophy of Literary Form. Okay. Philosophy and that's by form, yeah. Lukak or no, no, by by no, that's the daughter. Is yeah. Eleanor Leacock was yeah. the daughter of Kenneth Burke, who was a, a major figure. Yeah. Who actually, I mean, you know, this is interesting for you know left purposes. Had a, a, a great debate with uh, Sidney Hook on the dialectic that's reproduced in the early partisan reviews. Okay. Um, cool. Very, very significant debate in early, you know, American left circles, and you know. And, yeah. And and he and here's where you have another another fundamental break. In the United States, in France, at least, until the Nazi Soviet Pact of nineteen thirty nine and the Moscow trials of nineteen thirty six and seven. A, um, there was a left with different um, persuasions which talked to each other. Um, to be a Trotskyist or to be an anarchist or to be a um, follower of the car of the uh, of the what we call council of communists, which are which is Panikok and Gorder, Herman Gorder, and um, Paul Maddock, um, uh, was no sin. It was wrong from some point of view, but it was a honestly held position. After the Moscow trials and the Nazi Soviet Pact and the murder of Trotsky of 1940. From the point of view of the uh, Communist Party, the Trotskyists were agents of fascism. Um, Trotsky was to be uh, um, uh, basically uh, uh, attacked at every turn because they did have a movement, and in some places they called themselves a party which tried to compete with the CP. And um, um, the um, socialists were, uh, until um, even much later, a decade later at least, at least until the, um, the, the break with the Democratic Party in uh, 1947 and 8, 40, it begins in 46, but 7 and 8. The communists were, um, were were in dialogue with the Trotskyists, and the partisan review, which took, which went through a Trotskyist phase on its road to social democracy, and went to a social democratic phase on its road to liberalism. Uh, the Trotskyist view was that the party who supported the Nazi Soviet Pact had betrayed the working class. And uh, the party and the CP, of course, had betrayed uh, the, the, their relationship with, the, with, with Trotsky and with the Trotskyists. Um, and so what you had from the 1940s to the present time, to some extent, and had been temporarily sp broken in the, in, the, in the 60s, temporarily, um, you ha what you had was a constant monologue uh, declaring the supremacy of the Communist Party and the sellout of all the rest of them. Um, now, what's interesting about the Hook Dirk uh, debate, and there was a there was a hook, and there was a debate. Uh, also with Earl Browder, the head of the Communist Party, what was interesting is that they saw themselves sufficiently connected to talk to each other, to have dialogue. Uh, today, there's hardly any dialogue going on anywhere, but certainly between the Trotskyists and the, and the Communists, there has never been a genuine dialogue since the 1940s, late 30s, early 40s. 
and this raises and this raises another question. Uh, since uh, both of those movements, Trotsky's and Trotsky's and the CP, are in almost fatal disarray <coughs> in this country as well as in France as well as in Britain, what is the path ahead? Not what is the end, but what is the path ahead for the development of a revolutionary movement or even? an ultra-radical movement, whatever that might be. Whatever that might be. Coalitions? Uh, coalition, mm -hmm. well, people call, talk about coalitions and they do. You sounded like George Bush. Now. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> the next day, I'm just yeah, well, the, the, thing, the, thing, the thing that is so significant about, um, you know, the Russian Revolution is that it was a break, it was a rupture. Yes, and uh, there is it, you. It's hard to see how forming coalitions, you know, with social democrats are going to create a rupture. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me suggest to you, since you said that, that you might be interested in a pamphlet. I don't know whether it's in it's in print. If not, it will be in any good library and there are very few of them left, but you have to find one. Somebody called Paul C Cardin, C-A-R-D-A-N, <laughs> wrote a pamphlet on the May 68 events. There's another version of that, of, of, um, of that uh, of, in France, and there's another, there's another version, there are more than one version, but Cardin, whose real name is Castoriadis, uh, wrote the best, the best treatment, in my opinion. Um, the breach. The breach. Huh? The, the breach. The breach. The, 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 the breach. Which is the, the break. Yeah, the break. Right. And uh, Lefebvre, the explosion, too. Yeah, and Lefebvre's yeah, the explosion. L'implosion de Nanterre right. in right. France. Right. The explosion, the implosion in Nanterre, where, which was the beginning of the French May, and uh, beginning of the French May, and in, uh, in, uh, basically January um, 1968, which spread throughout the student movement and then spread to the workers' movement, and uh, the Communist Party's role in the breaking of the, of the, uh, the, the explosion, the, the breach, was uh, uh, ultimately the uh, basis of its own decline. It became a party in coalition with the Socialist Party in the French elections and got completely decimated by the French Socialists. Not in direct attack, but by basically taking over some of its uh, programs and putting them in, 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 in taking power. <coughs> now the communists no longer have 20% in France. What do they have? Any Hardly idea? anything. Six. Uh, what? Six, I think. Oh, that's interesting. Have, try 1.5%. One. Mm -hmm. But there is, which I don't really have a sense of its of its grounding and its art. It's uh, Mélenchon. Mélenchon. What part? What is that, France? Yeah, well, well that's a, that's, that's a, that's, that's a left way. The coalition. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a sense of what that yeah, comes out of. I just know that that's, that's the left party that has that's electoral right. traction. It came out of the CP. It came out of the CP. But it's a left reformist party. Yeah. 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 It's a left anti-immigrant party. Yeah. 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 Mélenchon. Oh boy. Yeah. Mm. All Sumis? What was the name of the, the party? Yeah. Something. Unbowed. Unbowed, for instance. Yeah. yeah. The Democratic Party of the left is still in, in Italy, it's still part of the governing coalition. So yeah, the, left, the Democratic Party of the left is still an electoral yeah. party of some, of some consequence. Right. They even get to be the... Uh, Prime Minister sometimes. Yeah, so, I mean... But it makes very little difference. Italy's a magnificent place. It's <laughs> <We've> been okay. <laughs> I don't so. know, it's kind of a mess oh, really? now. 
<laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> well, we have a fascist there now. <laughs> yeah. Italy has gone through the same thing that I think, you know, we've gone through, but it, but you don't feel it in Italy. I'm just saying. I, I think. Uh, I don't think that the people give a fuck one way or another that they're there. You know, I mean, that's my sense is that the last couple of summers traveling around Italy, I haven't had any sense. I mean, it's like it sort of tumbles over one side or another, but I don't think in the terms of the lived experiences of people's day to day life, it doesn't. You know, the state doesn't play the same yeah, they don't cultural really, they just role don't, yeah, in Italy. They don't really, yeah. The, the state is brought here when you're talking against each other. I don't think my sense, and I could be, you know, or just drinking wine, drunk, running around Sardinia or in, in, or in Sicily, is that people didn't, don't care one way or the other about who's really in charge. That's just, true they in just most don't countries give for a, most people. You know, that, I mean. The, the uh, colloquial expression is fiddler's fuck. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, I just don't. <laughs> not to dismiss the view, having a fascist in charge there, but I, I just uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, they're going to throw that coalition out soon, and somebody else will be there. And the Leaning Tower will continue to just about <laughs> fall over and not fall over. So, but, more, but but it is remarkable that the Italian Communist Party voluntarily dissolved and calls itself the Democratic Party now. Um, Refoundation and, and first, huh? Yeah. <coughs> Refoundation. Yeah. yeah. The Foundation, okay. yes. And that's why the Leaning Tower is leaning. Right, the Leaning yeah. <laughs> Ben's which metaphor was, there. Which yeah. was it? Uh, is it leaning left or right? Yeah. That's yeah. It. It's leaning. <laughs> <laughs> it's leaning. We're with her Galileo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you can I, still see I, hiking around Italy. You can still see the old communists. Like, like, there'll be like the communist meeting hall. And there'll be some vines crawling up, you know, yeah. the side of a wall. There'll be like a meeting hall. I mean, they're still around. But yeah. it doesn't look like anybody's been in the meeting hall for yeah. for decades. Yeah, we have union halls too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting um, uh, developments, which retards um, a genuine discussion of this pamphlet that we've read. And, and other things by Marx and Engels in favor of certain other things by Marx and Engels. One of the interesting things is that in Italy, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the workers movement that was, whose name was closely connected to Antonio Negri and even more in Italy <laughs> to Tronti. Tronti. The workers Tronti. movement uh, uh, had such ideological influence, anti gramsci influence, that in the 1960s, that was a debate within the Communist Party itself, as well as outside of the Communist Party, which was, uh, should the left follow the line of reformism, which had been endemic to the, to, to the international communist movement since the 1930s. One of the most important breaks in the communist movement was, took place in 1934 and 35, and it was called the United Front Against Fascism from 1930 which was a, a pamphlet written by George Dimitri, Dimitrov, who was a, the General Secretary of the Communist International, in which he called for the focus of the left to be, especially the Communist Party, but not just the Communists, but to try to get the Socialists to a great anti-fascism. <coughs> that the, the focus of anti-fascism uh, is perfectly consistent with the uh, term democratic socialist. If you ask the uh, garden variety democratic socialist, what they, there are some people who are not garden variety, but 50,000 people, uh, among them the garden variety is 49,900. 
Uh, the other one's say, community garden. What'd you say? The other one's community garden. Yeah. <laughs> right. What they meant by socialism. What do you think they would say? <clears throat> Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what. What's his name? The guy who runs for president. Yeah. Said. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> He's so memorable. <coughs> the former member of the Socialist Workers Party, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He says Medicare for all, another health care, free higher education. He has a whole program of reforms, and he says it publicly. And he calls that, he doesn't call it socialist anymore, but he, uh, he that's, his, that's what he means, by, that's what he's meant for a long time by socialism. And then you would get the other version, which is a version that you could find throughout the history of the communist and socialist movement and parties. What's the other version? The big version. Government ownership of major means of production? Ding. Public yeah. ownership. <laughs> Social ownership, public ownership of the means of production, and they make no distinction. Of course, Marx and Engels do make a distinction. Um, and that is consistent with the view <coughs> that had been characteristic of Marxism to a large extent between the wars in virtually every country. Economic determinism. Socialism is the social or public or, st or public ownership of the decisive <coughs> means of production. The socialists say, the socialist party people, the, the social democrats say, we do not in, in, intervene in cultural affairs, <coughs> which covers almost everything else except the economic relations of production because that splits the socialist movement. We can all agree on social ownership and the means of production, uh, but we do not interfere with the cultural affairs, the family, women's liberation. That, that they had to change. <laughs> you know, they didn't, they didn't want to. Well, he, sent, uh, Kolonata, what he, you say? he sent Kolonata uh, to Finland. He sent Alexandra Kolonata to Finland. Kolontai. Kolontai to, uh, what? to Finland, right? Made her an ambassador, got her out of the country. Stop. Right? Yeah, but where'd she spend most of her... Um, well, we were in Russia, but right? Now, where'd yeah. she spend most oh. of her ambassadorships? In the Scandinavia. Yes. Yeah, that's what she yeah. She became the Scandinavian yeah. ambassador of the Soviet Union. She and, and she and she reconciled herself with Stalin publicly, but there's an earlier Colin type who insisted that women's liberation was part of the communist program and wrote about it, and that is in print in English. What's somewhere. that? What is that book? Not a book, it's several books. K O Colon Tice, K O L L A N T A I, Alexandra Colon Tice. And, and, and there are two or three collections of her writings, most of which are about women's liberation and sexuality. Why don't we read some? I mean, like, it would be really fun to sit, and yeah, I love your references. That it would be really fun for us all to, to to read some of this stuff. I would not think that it would still be in print, but you should try it. Yeah. So Colin Ty Alexander. I mean, you know, sexual politics and Marx. This is, sounds kind of an interesting read. So it doesn't say sexual politics. Well, what, whatever you just said. I mean, you, you've made a reference to something. So, but I'm just saying it would be <coughs> fun to read some of these memoirs, some of these yeah, sure. these things as a group, because you know it's great it, underground it, history that getting lost otherwise. I'll see if I can find one. Yeah, that I would think be great. I know where there is one. Yeah. You probably know. 
Well, in house. your library, in your house, or maybe? Yeah, in my library. It's not alphabetical yeah. order, is it? No, it's not alphabetical order. I just wonder. It's a very different system. Yeah, okay. Maybe Warburg could bring this one up. No, 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 I mean, just finding this right. on the bookshelf took a while. <laughs> I'll tell you, this right. is not a big book, so it yeah. took me a while to dig through to find this. I had the manifesto in <laughs> volume one of the selected works. Okay, of so you could just pull it down. But I can't just find the volume one. Okay, well. It comes in all sizes. This is another size. Yeah. You know, <laughs> going back to uh, women's liberation for a second, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth had mentioned earlier in terms of patriarchal uh, idyllic relations and how you know you could read in between the Marx and Engels didn't really go that way. But in the origin of the family, private property in the state, there is part of the basis of that book is Bashafen's uh, mother right, Mother Right as uh, matriarchal societies and how right. they work in the air quiet. And he refers and, yeah, to right, right. that proposition has right. been yeah. the undisputed. Right, right. Who still exists here. Right, right. Anthropology has right. not accepted what it used to accept as matrilineal society. Matrilineal. They right. never accepted matriarchal right. societies okay. Okay. They never where walked. the leading figures were always women. Yeah. Um, Matrilineal societies are societies, societies in which. What? Property is handed down through the mother. Property is handed down through the mother. That's right. Right, yeah. No, the Germans, yeah. yeah. Actually, Marx and Engels have an, a concept which I'll just throw out, which might, you might find interesting. The concept is the concept of collective private property. Um, collective private property is where we run our affairs collectively, own the property collectively, but set limits on who is our, who is part of our community, and those who are not part of our community are not welcome to share in our property. So that, that, that's interesting. I just want, I just want to uh, mention something else. What time is it going to be? Quarter of. Quarter of. Um, <clears throat> since Lenin wrote a book on the development of capitalist agriculture in 1894, and, and especially after the Bolshevik Revolution, but not only uh, but not only Lenin's book, but that was the main influence. Every communist party who followed Lenin, every Leninist party, <coughs> not only had a program for the industrial proletariat, but had, but had a farm program. In the United States, by the way, the book is terrific. It's, I mean, it shows that he could have been a wonderful um, scholar. He was a very good scholar. And that book is his best scholarship, of course. Of course, after that, he was too busy doing revolutionary politics. Uh, he wrote a lot, but it was mostly polemical. He wrote a book, I have to say, before I go on, he wrote a book called um, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, in which he criticizes all of the idealists that he knows best, but particularly Mach and Avenarius, Ernst Mach and Avenarius, in his crude um, Marxism. And what is crude Marxism? From the philosophical <coughs> point of view. The correspondence theory of truth. Does that mean anything to you? Jim, does that mean anything to you? On your visit now? Can't say. 
Is it the same as vulgar Marxism? Yes. So it's just economistic Marxism. It's like yes, productivism. Yes, that's what it is. Well, right. what, how, how would you say it? Say it. <coughs> that you focus only on the field of production. Economic that's not what the correspondence theory of truth is. Correspondence theory of truth is science is about discoveries of which our ideas correspond, correct ideas. Um, material production is, of course, the key <coughs> um, to social science. The, the, uh, the, the uh, analysis of material production but as far as the rest of the world is concerned, science has, uh, um, has developed a series of theses, the scientific nature of which consists in mental images which correspond to their object. It's about the subject-object dialectic. Identity. It's about the, that subject and object are two separate parts of the world, that the that the sub that subjectivity is formed by the reflection <coughs> of ideas of that material world, whether it be of a natural scientific or a social scientific nature. It's for subjectivity is formed by what? It's called materialism and imperial criticism. Yeah. So now, he's, he's talking about the reflection theory of cognition. That's right. Yeah. We call of it knowledge. Of things. Yeah. And the correspondence theory of truth. Right. We can have all kinds of ideas which are not true, but if they're true, they will correspond to the object. Um, the best philosophical essay on this is Heidegger on the essence of truth. He lays bare this stuff, at least within the history of philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a very good essay on what, you know, Truth is the search now for truth I, and the various I theories had, of truth. <coughs> I had the I had the good on fortune. the essence of truth. I had the good fortune to stumble on an essay by somebody called Albert Einstein, in which he says that um, his. theory of relativity was an attempt to um, um, elaborate, especially in mathematical terms, Ernst Mach's theory of knowledge. And so we have two books in English, my German is not good, of Ernst Mach, The Science of Mechanics and the Analysis of Sensations. And I went through both of the books and found Ernst Mach was a 19th century philosopher connected to the idealist movement, the Kantian. And he did have a, uh, a verbal version of what Einstein talks about as the theory of relativity. And, uh, it's an, he, and he elaborates it. It's in the science of mechanics. Um, Lenin, of course, uh, at the time when he wrote this, which is 1903, I think, believed that um, with all, almost all Marxists that um, um, Einstein, not Einstein was a footnote, but that um, Mach was a, an idealist to be fought against and, and of an illness also and dismissed. Neocontinence. Neocontinence. And of course when, when Einstein said, Einstein does not play in di dice, uh, I'm God, sorry. God, God, God doesn't yeah. not But he is God like God. Yeah. God doesn't play <laughs> dice with the university. He, he, uh, he's, it's proven that he's, he's religious, mm -hmm. which of course is, needless to say, untrue. <laughs> um, it's, it took Marxism. Now Einstein wrote the essay in 1905 on the special theory of relativity. It took Marxism under Soviet leadership 
exciting. Another almost century before it acknowledged the special theory of relativity. By that time, Einstein had come to the, ge the general theory and had proven, he, he thought, the general theory of relativity, which is a, a, a much deeper analysis of um, the world and its relationship to knowledge, that we can know the totality of the world. We can, we're not just uh, condemned to know pieces of it. To my knowledge, I've read a lot of Soviet um, scientific literature. To my, that's, per, that's in, done in English, and I own it. To my knowledge, the, the, the Marxists haven't gotten uh, Einstein right at the general theory. They, they know the, the special theory, and they're happy to, to, to acknowledge and to appropriate him right now. Um, but they still have a, they still had a fight at least at, before 1991 within the scientific community about uh, the general theory of relativity. Only, only, only uh, Marxism-Leninism could know the totality by, by, by definition. You put Boris Hessen in that huh? one? Boris Hessen. Well, Hessen has a hundred-page mm -hmm. um, essay that veers close to Einstein, mm -hmm. but it, c it should be understood within the Marxist framework. Let me explain. Um, Boris Heston, Hessen, although he, his, his real name seems to be Gessen. Gessen. The book, the essay, which is in a book that was published in 1931, which he delivered, the essays delivered a hundred pages. I, I, he didn't talk it, he must have delivered it in English or in some, or French, which were acceptable languages. And, uh, goes through Newtonian physics and makes the argument that Newtonian physics is the mathematical, physical scientific expression of three practical um, needs of, 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 of state. One of them is navigation. Um, and the second is artillery, namely all forms of um, of, 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 of guns. And what the hell is the third? Do you remember anybody? No, I forgot. Huh? No, I forgot. Yeah, I but but yeah. essentially that it that I mean, science follows science follows and technique, and, science, yeah, yeah. and technique does not follow science. Yeah, right. That was his that was his view. But you could state it in another more um, acceptable way to people who might not agree with technical science, the technique science thing, <coughs> that no scientific formulation can be understood in isolation from the conditions of its production, both its internal conditions and the history of the discipline within which it functions, as well as the external conditions. The best exposition of the Marxist theory of science that we have, it seems to me, is by two biology, bio, biologists. Levens. Huh? Levens, one of them? And Lewontin is the other. And the book is called Dialectical Biologist. Biology. And, and, they act, and they actually uh, talk about their own experience as biologists and reinterpret their experience in terms, essentially, of the subject-object relation, but do not infer that the subject is separate from the object. But that it is analytically separated um, uh, and in their experience 
they believe that the conditions within which any living thing functions cannot be understood properly without reference to the objective conditions under which it developed, including the laboratory, the state, capitalism, etc. Now it should also be true of social science. Now we have, um, we have it against Lenin. The evidence of um, 19th century biology, late, late 19th century biology, not Darwinism, but the view that human beings are divided hierarchically between uh, people who are born uh, less intelligent than others, and that intelligence is inborn. I have a daughter who believes that intelligence is inborn. He's in, she's Which been imperfectly <laughs> trained by her parents. Yes. <laughs> I, I say when, I, when, when they when, when people point, point point to me, I say, wait a minute, not so fast. In the first place, my mother was a violinist and a painter, not professionally, but she painted all the time and she played the violin all the time uh, in the house and. Um, my father was a poet, and I had been a journalist before the New York world folded, and he became a, um, a technician for the Port Authority. I said, but they had books in the house, and I, was, I read Virginia Woolf's To the White House at the age of 12. I read the leading novelists of my, of, of my uh, teenage. I was a teenager <coughs> in, in 1950. Who were the leading novelists? Faulkner? Yeah, but nobody read them. Hemingway? I can't read Faulkner, they would say. And they would say the only Faulkner you could read is some of his more popular things. And things like Absalom, Absalom, you could not read them. Best. Sound and the Fury, you could not read them. Try. But who, yeah, I thought they would always be part of it. Who else? Uh, you'd be, you'd be Hemingway? Camus? Uh, Hemingway? Hemingway Camus? for sure. Stunned. Yeah. He, 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 Old Man in the Sea is written pretty Wonderful. close to the time when, <coughs> when I'm a teenager. My favorite of his. And who else? Jean Paul Sartre. That there were two novelists and everybody else was. Uh, was Fitzgerald, of course. Fitzgerald. It was something Every literate kid. Gertrude Stein. Who? Gertrude Stein. Gert did not read Gertrude Stein. <laughs> Stein read would have been. F. Scott Fitzgerald. And what were some of his uh, works? F. Scott Fitzgerald? The yeah. uh, Tender is the Night. What? Tender is the Night. Tender is the Night, huh? Yeah. Gatsby. 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 Gatsby is his most Gatsby. famous Gatsby. novel. Yeah. <laughs> right? Isn't that good? Well, Tender Night true. is really good. Lask Tycoon, not very famous. Solberg, Monroe Star, right? Yeah. Who else? Hollywood. Look Home with Angel. Look Home with Angel. Thomas Wolfe. Yeah. Thomas Wolfe. I love that. Nobody reads Thomas Wolfe today, do they? You can't go home again. Yeah. The journalist. Theodore Dreiser. King Carey. How's the word? Sister Carey. Sister. Yeah. Sister. American tragedy. A girlfriend of mine, when we were teenagers, we read American Tragedy out loud to each other. <laughs> what, what would you read out loud? Huh? What would you read out loud? The Beat Poets? What would you guys read no, out we loud? we read Theodore Dreiser. That's a little, that's a tough book to read out loud. That's <laughs> a tough did book read to read out loud. You read that out loud? <laughs> no. Wow. That's of America I read out loud. Okay, and, yeah. And, sure. and, and, and how about, how Sinclair about Lewis. the Nobel Prize winners? Even if they didn't get it at the time. 
Carson McClure. I mean McClure. She didn't win the Nobel Prize. You're probably reading Ooh. that. McClure's. Carson McClure's. <coughs> Hard as a lonely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, you know, old, uh, my old hometown. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What's your hometown? Atlanta, Georgia. Columbus is a suburb. Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> so yeah. All right. Carson McClure. You brought up the Port Authority. Yeah. And Port of New York Authority. It's technical. Yeah. If you could get into that a little bit, it's it's it's. Who, who do they represent? But getting back to communism, they didn't and represent private anything. <laughs> they were all right. <laughs> the Port Authority of New York was established. Oh, sorry, I'm just kidding. I believe it was established shortly after the war to coordinate various activities of construction of ports. Um, highways, uh, seaports, highways, uh, airports. The coordination, however, devolved into the Port Authority actually letting contracts to build. One of those contracts was uh, led to Idlewild, another one to a place called Holland Tunnel, another one to the Lincoln Tunnel. My father worked on the Lincoln Tunnel and he worked on Idlewild. He was an ins a materials inspector because he was literate. <laughs> and why wouldn't he be, be, and he took a test. And, and he had served during the Second World War as a materials inspector in the United States Army Engineers. As a civilian, because he had a child. Um, employee, but he was employed by the Port Authority, a U.S. Army affiliated, but the Port Authority had employed initially. Uh, anyway, um, the Port Authority is today appointed by the governors of Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, primarily by the governors of, Con of, of New York and New Jersey who take an active role. <coughs> Can you imagine this synthetic coordinating function being in the hands of that uh, uh, blind spirit, Andrew Cuomo? <laughs> blind spirit? Or that other one before, Chris Christie. And Chris Christie? <laughs> 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 And Thomas Dewey, right, right, right. although Thomas Dewey, they made the appointments of the uh, of the executive director and the leading uh, executive officers. So wouldn't that be an example of government ownership of the means of production? <laughs> <laughs> the government control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A regulation. But. I'll give you an example of what the of what the cost could be. So my father is working at the Holland Tunnel in 1946 or seven, and one of the main contractors of the Port Authority was Starrick Brothers in Aiken. They made materials. They didn't make uh, houses or um, airport um, 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 uh, technology. <coughs> they, they made materials and they were delivering materials to the Holland Tunnel, which my father had to inspect. And so they offered him a bunch of money to say yes when he said to them, the same right. You gotta do it over again. And he said, "Sorry, I don't play that game." And he got to and he he got to be known by the contractors who were big uh, as somebody you couldn't bribe. But he knew guys who were bribable, and they and, and he had to um, decide whether to report it or not. And he reported it, even though he knew the guys might be hurt, not fired. You know, and uh, that was a problem. What happens if you if you report a bribe? <laughs> he might be wrong. What? He might be wrong too. No, but he 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 was he was pretty clean. 
but didn't couldn't people make things uncomfortable for him? What? Yeah. Couldn't they make him other people he was No, but he wasn't like the only clean guy. Yeah. Um no, he well, was these actually, days there are no clean guys. He was actually <laughs> Nobody. not not gonna be threatened. Look. Um if you if the Starrett brothers uh, they dropped Eakin, I don't know what happened to Eakin. Starrett Brothers supplies most of the building materials that are produced in New York City. It does uh, practice bribery, but it can afford to clean the entire slate of uh, inspectors and risk itself becoming part of the problem. So it um, makes a lot of money on, on people that it, uh, my father says Stuyvesant Town, which he worked on, was one of their great victories. He said, he, we couldn't afford Stuyvesant Town, but he wouldn't live there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said it was really, it was really where corruption was. Yeah. Supreme. Well, now at Stuyvesant Town, I've got some friends who are elders, and they're scared people are trying to bump them down the stairs so that's they can, right. uh, <laughs> you know, maybe get out of their apartment faster. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> what do you want to read next week? Next week? Well, yeah. Well, I had an idea of what to read, but I don't know how we're going to do it. I want to read. I asked you to inve to 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 uh, investigate whether we can print on. Well, we could Co find computer. out uh, tonight or tomorrow and then send out and then an email and send that out, too. We can put it up on the website. If we can put it, upload it. Can we upload the, this? Well, let's see if it's available. It's chapter it's two. Possible. Chapter two of Left Turn. Okay. Left Turn. Chapter two. Do you have Left Turn? I have I do. There yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Left but Turn, by the way. And Elizabeth has, has a hard copy of it. Yes. I have a copy. Left Turn yeah, is a book that I wrote. And the only reason I'm assigning it is because it does raise a lot of issues. Yes, it does. Yeah. Chapter <laughs> two raises a lot of issues. So we'll, we'll we'll check to see if we can get it to the website. You know, if Great. we can find it. And if not, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's available. Do you know? Uh, can we go to Amazon quickly? Yeah. Or is that I possible? Yeah. 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 Uh, I just want to say that. Yeah, it is. It's 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 a little pricey, like yeah, over twenty, it? I think. Is it? I, I, I mean, it sets up a nice book. I try to, I try to um, find a substitute book. I don't see it. Nobody in, a, in English, at least in America, or on Amazon, nobody has written a book. Maybe they have, but that is easily available that raises the fundamental issues of how do you make a path forward. What we, ha what we have is a bunch of books, and they're all getting uh, celebrated by Amy Goodman, who I'm sure is not paid for her celebration, but she's, uh, she has them on every week, at least for 20 minutes. We have books that expose um, um, You're big time, Stanley. 50 bucks if you get it from Prime by Amazon. How much is it? Yeah, 50. I got a soft cover. You can get covers. used copies from 597 to 50. That's what yeah. I was about to say. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, can get not. used copies. They have 32 used copies yeah. on file. 51 <coughs> used from 597 to no Okay. I thought I got well, this. The we should be literature sometimes, Stanley. What did you say? No, sometimes. Just, I'm just going to... Women, no, no, sometime, no, no. and some literature. No, sell I've books. never read a novel with you. No, it would be fun. <laughs> Start with your fun. It would be fun. Start with your daughter. Yeah, you yeah. What would you say? her work. Have, have her read some of your daughter. No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> we could read Absalom, Absalom in here and slug it out. That would be pretty good. It's a great book. Yes. Thank you, Stanley. Really appreciate it. You see, the problem is, as we were growing up, well, we'll send out an email. Or you're either a Faulknerite or a uh, Hemingwayite. Most of my friends were Hemingwayites. They never read Faulkner. I read Faulkner. That reason wrote badly when I first started. How much is it per session? 
15. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll do, no, I'll just do 10 next week. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, do we have everybody's uh, email? Yes, do we, we have do. your email? Everybody's. Yes, yes we do. We do. We have Ben. We have your 